No, this is a repeat of uh, 32 because it goes from dark to light and out from light out to dark. Any questions on that? And all of mine are uh, patterns and all my uh, um, repeats are um, even numbers of 8 or 16 so that they will always go back to, you know, meet. <laughs> And I found that an even number is easier for me to work with. And if I always do the same thing, all of my patterns will work out, will work together. So like if I decided I wanted to put this on here, it would work on here. So any of these designs could go on any one of my products. Any questions on that, the repeat of eight? <laughs> Yes. And you can make an indexing wheel from the graph paper maker. You can download, you know, the multiple of eight, and then you can put that onto a piece of wood, and you can uh, index from that. Um, my husband, <laughs> he made me an indexing wheel in that pattern for me and he's in the back of the room and he could explain how you make that wheel. <laughs> so yeah, he made a really nice wheel for me to be able to do that. I like to do it off the way so I could sit in the other room and sit there and index uh, all these uh, turnings that I've done and watch TV at the same time because it really is pretty boring to draw straight lines forever. <laughs> no, uh, he made a stand that I can put my chuck onto and with the indexing wheel and uh, it works really well. Um, I don't know if I do or not. Do you have a uh, picture of it? <laughs> He's going to look. What was that? Uh, a multiple of eight, and when I was doing uh, these plates right here, I was only using a quarter of the, um, of the ones on my wheel. So... <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> um, so there's probably, uh, I did, let's see, I'll have to count them. There's two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen. So there's a sixteen, there's thirty-two, so by four. So there's quite a few on there. <laughs> I don't want to even try to count how many is on this one right here, the big one. There's quite a few on that over us. I'd say there's probably over 200 <laughs> lines on either side. Mm -hmm. What I like to do is make sure this, the fattest bead in the middle is square. And then whatever, however skinny it is here, I don't like to have an oblong bead, you know, a real wide one. I like it, I don't like it to look like this right here. That's just too big or half of that's too big. I like it, the biggest bead to be a square. That's what I try for. And I've seen people that they do, I mean, they're probably a sixteenth of an inch apart. And uh, that, the person I've seen that did that, it, his lines were a lot fainter and not all of them were complete. Because I think if they were all complete, it would just be way too busy. It would take away from the pretty pattern he put on there. And if I understood how he, that person was doing it, he actually indexes it quite a bit like I do. I don't know if he does a repeat of eight on it, but what he would do is he would uh, 
design where he wanted his pattern, he'd burn all those little squares in that, and then he would burn uh, the rest of them on the outside of his pattern, which I think would be really hard. <laughs> so, any more questions? I, and I think in order to really understand how you do this, you really have to put a you know pencil to paper and. And watercolors is a really good way to put your colors in there onto your paper. I mean, it really doesn't matter. And this is a set that I got at Hobby Lobby. And um, it has quite a few colors in it. A good variety of warm colors and blue colors. and. Um, this is the package it came in. What is there? 24 colors. And there's some metallics in there, which I thought was really cool for doing, uh, you know, the dragonfly. Yeah, all of these uh, sunflower in here, they're all watercolor. And these are a little stocky, but I thought they turned out really pretty well. They're for, they're, what is it, $14 at Hobby Lobby. And uh, if you download their app, you get a 40% off coupon, just 10 bucks. So for you, and I thought the colors are really pretty nice. And uh, there's a mixing chart you can get at Hobby Lobby. And, you know, they have the basic colors here along the bottom and uh, what's in them, it goes at an angle that's the pure color right there. And it tells, it tells you, you know, in this chart, what you'll get mixing these two colors together. And you'll get a good idea on mixing. I thought this was a cheater way. <laughs> but it's watercolors. You can uh, have a sample piece of wood because what it's going to look like here and what it looks like on paper is two different things because watercolors are transparent and the wood color will add to it. It'll change the colors like um, I think that if you put uh, blues on here on, on this piece, right here it's darker yellow than this one is and so that's going to change what it looks like so it uh blue kind of turn out have a, a little bit of a green cast to it because of the yellow okay what i use is a mat uh, Cryolon spray and I spray it. Uh, I wait a couple days and kind of let them settle for a while and then I spray it with the Cryolon and then I, I do two or three coats of that and then I like to use that uh, orange oil and beeswax and just apply it over the top of it and I think it looks a little nicer. You, I wouldn't try buffing it. <laughs> <laughs> because the watercolors are going to smear, and the inks would too. There's uh, um, uh, nothing that, that I can think of that you could put on here. The Krylon is the spray. It's not going to get down into every little nook and cranny, and if you do spray it so many times that it is down in there, then it gets kind of sh uh, shiny and it looks like plastic. That's it. I think I've got it in here. Nope, it's um, Howard's, I think. I think you can get it at Home Depot. Thought I brought it, but... Um, well, this is what it is. It'll look like this right here. It's just a little bit more protective than the, uh, just the Krylon. Beeswax. Yeah. And uh, if you put some of it out in a little cup, a glass bowl or something, and then you microwave it for about two or three seconds, it melts it down. And then I apply it, and it soaks in better. Mm -mm. Well, I'm done with it. 
but you know, spraying it with the Krylon to kind of fix it. And then when I am putting it, the, the orange on there, I am doing it very gently. <laughs> yeah. And I do let things cure for a couple days in between the spraying the Krylon and um, doing the orange oil. I don't know how long this cure time is, but... Uh, I think it is in the paint supplies. I don't, I don't know. I was 8 o'clock. Uh, I've got some more time. I can do a little wood burning of the dragonfly. Do you guys have any more questions on the designing of it? Uh, I just know it's a mat. I don't know if it's the old 500. But, uh, that part I don't, don't know. I just know it's a matte spray. I try, you know, sometimes you can't get matte. It is hard to find, and I get a semi-gloss if I can't find matte. Walmart does? Mm-hmm. Oh, you could probably do that, too. I just like how the orange oil smells. <laughs> It smells very nice applying it. <laughs> I'm going to switch tips here. This is what I like to use for shading tips or for outlining all of this. And I do turn it down and it's probably at between a one and a two. It's fairly low. And uh, these Optima, they're pretty thin, the metal is, and it heats up very quick. And you, when you're going to do shading and you're going to do this, you really want to test it. It's, it's a shading tip. It appears to be perfectly flat on the bottom, but it's not. It's slightly uh, curved. And uh, the number that I use on the dial here is going to be different. What's the right? Oh. I got the right one plugged in. There it's finally heating. A little low. I was shading all last night between a one and a two, and here it's right on a three. So I like when I'm doing this, I like to be right up here on the tip, and I'm just going to be very lightly touching this, and I'm outlining it. And this is the bottom of the dragonfly. I don't know. Very light touch. Oh, it would be really bad to have a donut and uh, drink a bunch of Thai tea. <laughs> it would be a lot of sugar and a lot of caffeine and my hand would be going like this. And what's bad is they've polished the top of this um, pen, the tip, and uh, the light hits it and shines right back in my eyes. <laughs> and I thought that I had my carving tools really polished up and shiny, and I've never had that happen to me with my carving tools with a light reflects right back in my eyes. So it's a very, very light touch. And I'm right on the tip of the shader. It, from uh, side to side, on either side of it, it's slightly curved on the bottom, concave on the top. 
and I'd say it's fairly flat out here at the tip. I mean, it's a very slight curve. It's like uh, one would be perfectly flat, flat, and this is probably like between a two and a three. It's a, just a slight curve. So with this one here, I don't want to do a lot of shading on uh, the dragonfly itself. I'm just doing an outline because I want the color of the dragonfly to shine through. And I do more of the black background uh, you know, with my shader. Well, on this one right here, on the uh, dragonfly's head, I didn't like it, so I took a rotary tool with a uh, googie sander, and the googie sander is a rolled up piece of sandpaper that's glued, and it's on a little mandrel, and I sanded it off, and down to bare wood. If it's a slight mistake, you can... Um, try sanding it off or I've got this little chisel. Chisels are flat and gouges have a curve to it and you can sit there and you could scrape it like a scraper. But I actually like sanding it with the Googie sander much better because it blends in quite quickly and it's a lot faster and you get a better result. Because if you use this uh, tool here and scrape it, you would still have to sand it to a 400 to get a nice smooth. So I completely took off the, the dragonfly's head and redid it. <laughs> A Gurkee sander, you can uh, get it from, I, I'm not sure if uh, Woodcraft uh, carries them, but there's a uh, woodcarver, I don't know if you've been to Squat, but uh, Dallas DG of, uh, what I can't remember, is it the wood shop, the old wood shop uh, in uh, Houston carries the Gurkee sander. I really don't know if Woodcraft carries them. But the woodcarvers, the uh, birds in particular, they uh, really like those Gigi Sanders, the ones that do the really gorgeous bird carvings that look real. So it really doesn't take very long to outline this little guy. And you know, I thought, oh, I can do a dragonfly, no problem. I know what one looks like. I had no idea what they had look like. <laughs> And I don't put any legs on it. I'm sure they have legs, but I didn't put any on. <laughs> yep, they folded up when I took off. You can see I practically have the whole thing outlined. And you could go with that and leave it just outlined like that, but I kind of like a dark background because it makes the uh, object pop. And so I want to test again, make sure it's not too dark. And you can't just go uh, and just burn it dark like this one. If you did, you get blotchy. You have to work up to it. So I like to start in a corner and just, I'm just on the tip real close in there. When I'm on the edge or close in there, I'm just on an edge. 
put out here, I just do little circles. And I'm on the flat, and I'm trying really hard not to get one side or the other to dig in. So I'm trying to stay out in the middle on the, that slight curve. And you just sit there and this is tedious work <laughs> in here. It takes a while to burn, build up the color. So I did a light color and I came back over it and I'm darkening it. I personally like how the wood grain shows through. And I've done it where it looks like it's just cloud floating away from it, so it slowly No, it's not. You don't if it's Smoking, you really pretty much have it too high. This, that, this right here, you have to build up the color. If you came in there with a real hot one, you would have divots. And you would never get it smooth. You want little, you want to build up the color. It would burn into it. It wouldn't be nice and smooth and shiny. On, on this one right here, it has dark spots on it, light and dark ones, and I don't mind that. I don't like it where it's burned, uh, you know, a dent into it. Yes, all of it's watercolors. Uh, this piece here, this piece, and this piece are the India 8, and uh, this one he here, I uh, did with the pen, and I was halfway through with the red on here, and the pen I was using dried up on me. And I went to the store and got the same colored pen, but it wasn't the same dye lot. It was a different color. And so I ended up having to go over that one to blend it in, and I wasn't happy. <laughs> And so the next time I decided, well, if I'm going to do a big project like that, I'm going to get the bottles of ink and use a brush so that I would have a consistent color. And you can add um, alcohol to, it, to the ink and dilute it down. You could actually add water, but I liked using the alcohol because it dried a lot quicker. And uh, you could mix up a big batch of that and have a consistent color. And that was really good, but what happens with the ink on here, if you make a mistake, it soaks into that. And it's really hard to get it off. You pretty much have to carve away a bead in order to get rid of the color. And so I decided to try some watercolors just at a whim because I wanted to paint this in in watercolors. And watercolors pretty much... Uh, stay wherever you're, you put them. They don't wick unless it's wet. The wood is wet, then it's going to wick all over the place, but watercolors are going to stay in one spot for the most part. You know, if it's in grain, well, it's going to go down the tube and come out someplace else. <laughs> yeah, a little tiny spotter brush. So you just sit there and you build up the color and it does take a bit of time to build up that much black. So you do some, a little bit of it and then you go do some turning. Come back and do some more of it. You don't just sit there and do it all in one session. Here are the brushes that I like to use on here. Um, this is the little spotter that I use, and it works really well to get in here and paint those beads without touching the bead above or below it or whatever. Way better than the pens do because those pen tips are really pretty thick compared to this brush. If you have a wider uh, 
little bead, I you can use a little tiny flat brush. But for the most part, I use this little spotter right here, and they're like three dollars in an art supply store. I bought this at um, uh, what is it, uh, Azel Art Supply, and they're like three dollars. And I pretty much have this brush right here. It it looks pretty wigged out. This one here is the same as the one right there. And it looks pretty stressed out, but if I get it wet, it'll go back in, and I can still use this. And I pretty much, all of those that were watercolors, I used that brush right there for three bucks. It, it's going to last me a long time, and if I would take the time and, and clean them out after I'm done painting, not just lay them down, they would probably last a little longer. Yeah, it's a um, uh, three-aught spotter. I don't know if the camera can picture that or not, but I'll leave it out and... You got it? The brand. And uh, I use this brush right here for doing doing all of the um, watercolors of the little leaves in here. I like a a skewed or an angled flat brush for doing that because you've got a nice point on it and you can get into the little corners. And if you could, if you use just a regular flat brush like this, you wouldn't be able to get in there and so well and you'd have to end up using a round but with a um, angled or skewed flat brush they all call it something different each brand and this is a half inch and it's pretty versatile the half inch you can I did all of that with the, this one here that's wood burned in like this one here this one is just burned, and then I've added one layer of, or a couple layers of color into that. If, if you look in here, there's some, um, first there's yellow, and then there's a darker yellow right along there, and there's a little bit of a rusty brown right there, reddish brown, and out on the tip. Right here is a, just a little bit of white. On the dragonfly right here, that white that's on here is actually this little um, pen right here. It's a white gel pen. And it, I had it, yeah, Michael, I had it looking like that and it was all with the brown outlines and I decided I'm going to see what this will look like on there and I actually really liked the white. I thought it added to it. And on this one here, I've outlined it with the wood burner and that was more so that I would have a stopping point for where I'm going to be shading and putting the black in there because I really don't do any shading whatsoever on the dragonfly itself. It's just on the, uh, on the plate itself uh, around it. And then I come back with color. But this really painted up very quickly, this dragonfly. I took a little bit of this metallic color here. This uh, set has uh, a few metallic colors right in here, and I used this blue metallic and mixed it with a little bit of this darker blue to brighten it up, and then I painted it on there, and then I used a little bit of, I think it was this red, and um, added a little blue to it to make it a lavender to put in this pink color. So I did a little mixing of colors. And I like to test 
uh, the colors also on a piece of wood to see what they're going to look like. And um, I'll, I'll decide uh, what colors I'm going to paint something. And then I'll put the colors out on the piece of wood to see if they can, they're compatible together before I put it out here. <laughs> and they'll like it. But with watercolors, if you didn't like this and you haven't sealed it, you can take a brush that's just wet with water and you can lift all that color out of there. And if you get uh, any of the color along in here, you just need to take a clean brush with water and wipe it away. <laughs> and so it's, compared to the ink, it's very forgiving. You could, um, some of the colors are staining and some of them uh, uh, will just, you can wash them away completely, no stain left at all. So you can change things a lot easier with the ink. And I don't think that you can see a difference really between this and this in colors, other than this has been waxed already. The, uh, the inks are no more permanent than the watercolors. If you uh, went and got this wet before it was sprayed, it would just bleed out all over the place. And you're not going to lift those out with water. <laughs> this one you could. This one here has been waxed, sprayed and waxed, but this one hasn't. You can see a difference between the top and the bottom. And I don't, uh, this one feels drier to me than this. I probably, I think this one needs another coat of the wax on it. Any questions on it? Yes, 400, um, and if it's a super dry piece of wood, I might even sand it to 600 or, or better. You don't want it to be polished where it's such a hard, smooth surface that your watercolors won't uh... I haven't. I think the grain would probably raise somewhat on the end grain, but uh, for the most part, I don't think it, it changed any. The, uh, Ink would raise the grain just as much as the watercolors would, I would think. No, it's really, this one has, doesn't have any sealer on it at all, and I would just say the grain is uh, raised at all on this one. It feels very smooth to me, a little dusty, but <laughs> this one here has been at this stage for a little while because I had to go teach a class, but it's very smooth. I don't think it's raised the grain at all. So this one needs, this one's got a little orange in there on top of the light uh, yellow with buildup of color. It's not quite done. This side here is more what I want it to look like. It's got a little bit more orange going in here. More, it's got some hot white highlights in here, which just gives it a little bit more depth. Uh, burning the center of it. Let's see, do I have one for this right here? It's really an easy technique for burning the center. See if I can find my tip that I use for for the center of a sunflower. Well, see the last one I could possibly pick up. There it is. I actually get this fairly hot <laughs> when I'm doing uh, the center of the sunflower. 
Come on. Okay. I'm not patient. I'm going to turn it all the way up. I'm going to make it smoke, and then I'm going to turn it down to about halfway. And it's really an easy to do the thinners on a sunflower like this one right here. I don't know if you focus, I don't have a... So you just start out here. This is a tip I've used. It's kind of very pointed and narrow. And I just set it down in there. And I actually, this is uh, more like branding it. One right next to the other. And I think it looks like the seed or the center of it. And you just keep going around in a circle and around in a circle. You're just overlapping it. Very simple, quick process. Not quick. <laughs> it does take a, a little while to build up all of that. And you just keep going. I would go around the entire edge of it and then go again and again and again and then you'll see more. It'll stay circular. If you do halfway and you work in, it's going to be kind of candy wampus. So that goes really fairly quick on that. Any other questions on how I've done any of this? <laughs> well, thanks. <laughs>